I had serotonin syndrome. I lost the ability to walk. I uh, had rhabdo. Um, I had MCAS issues. I was having POTS issues, like, you know, all of these things. So it's important to look at the body as a system. I, I very much am um, influenced by Dr. Gilbert Ling and Dr. Ray Pete. And I do think that, you know, the, the field effect, looking at things together, not isolated, is very important because in my case, like, I literally was just failing all over the place. <laughs> like, as I imagine a lot of you all are doing, like, your, your body is just failing all over. Guys, she has two beautiful, healthy sons. And like, that is incredible. The fact that she overcame all of these battles and ultimately was able to give birth twice to two healthy kids, like, that is incredible. That's so cool. So yeah, like none of what you experienced defines you. Like you are just now like a strong, healthy, loving mother. But then there's this whole story behind you. So welcome back to the Rooted in Resilience podcast, season two, our first guest episode with one of our favorite humans that we've never met in real life. But Kathleen, we can't wait to have you at the farm. I She's probably the smartest individual I've ever met in my life <laughs> and has built so many connections in terms of connecting all the dots with human health. And she has overcome extreme challenges with her health, which I think is really awesome to hear about. And I think it's going to also inspire a lot of you that you can heal. And the body is really amazing. So Kathleen, Welcome Thank to so the Rooted in Resilience podcast. Uh, today, we're going to be talking, give a little bit of a backstory of one of Kathleen's favorite studies called the Minnesota Starvation Experiment. And this overview will kind of just touch on why we all believe that the amount of calories that someone eats is really important to overall health. And we'll do a bunch of future episodes diving into kind of some of the specific symptoms that we're that came from this experiment as a result of under eating for long periods of time. But before we get to that, Kathleen, welcome. Thank you. Can you provide a little backstory of what challenges you have faced in your health and where you're at today? Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I definitely appreciate it. Um, so my backstory is quite involved. I've had uh, numerous diagnoses, as I imagine many of your listeners have had as well. Um, everything from serotonin syndrome, recurring rhabdomyolysis, ketotic hypoglycemia, MCAS, uh, POTS slash dysautonomia. Um, I've had three concussions. I've uh, diagnosed with HEDS. I've had multiple dislocations to my left shoulder and subluxations, at least 19 dislocations to my left shoulder. I had a frozen shoulder, so adhesive capsulitis for th uh, three years. Um, so it's, it's quite involved. Uh, so I, I understand where people very much come from. And I understand it can be very difficult to be, you know, in the midst of all of that. Um, I was diagnosed with CFSME, you know, um, all of these things. So I, I like to say there is, you know, there is the end of the tunnel. You can come through these things. It takes, um, it does take some time. I think, you know, we've talked about Dr. Ron Davis and his CFSME lab and he kind of shows that it takes about seven to 10 years to potentially come out of CFSME. And that was for sure my experience. Um, so before that, my you know academic background, I have a BS in physics from the US Naval Academy. I have a um, MS in physics from UC Davis, and I have a, a master's of engineering and chemical engineering from UC Davis too. Um, so I was in the Navy for, um, well, the four years at the Naval Academy and then the three years uh, that I served in the Navy, I went through a medical discharge because of all everything I went through health-wise. Um, and, you know, people ask me, like, given that laundry list of diagnoses, um, you know, what led to them? And I can't say it was one thing. It, I think like most people, you know, a lot of people are looking for that one thing. Is it, is it Lyme? Is it hormones? Is it oxalate? You know, stress, whatever it is. Um, and in my situation, it, it was not one thing. It, it was a multitude of things. Uh, the stress of being in the military, the stress of, you know, under eating, and then like kind of the fast binge cycle that I know a lot of us go through, especially because I wanted to fix my appearance. But the more I tried to fix my appearance, my basically my body composition, the worse I became, which goes into a lot of the Minnesota starvation experiment that we'll discuss later. Um, you know, there. I know vaccination is a very touchy subject, but um, you know I did have a pretty severe reaction to the flu vaccine that led to me 
going to the hospital um, for 10 days. Um, but it was also a, a bunch of other things that intermixed with that as well. So I can't say it was just the flu vaccine, but it, you know, so there's a lot of things basically. So I understand where people come from when it's like, oh my goodness, I have all these diagnoses. I have all these potential contributions. So that's causing my diagnoses and I don't know what to do. And so eventually you see people just freeze. And at a point, like I was kind of frozen. I was like, well, you know, what do I do? Um, like I said, I, I was in the hospital for 10 days at one point and the doctors had had no clue what to do for me. Um, I went in and my, that was the first time I had rhabdo and my rhabdo, you know, you hear that people that do like CrossFit and stuff for the first time they get rhabdo. Um, I did not get rhabdo because I was excessively working out. I love to work out, but that's not the reason why I got it because of a metabolic issue. Um, but mixed with that was MCAS, POTS, CFSME, all of that stuff. And doctors literally didn't know what to do. You know, five days in, we got some lab tests back from the CDC in Boston because they had to send it off because they had no clue what was going on. But at five days in, I lost the ability to walk. So I was in a wheelchair for a while. Um, eventually progressed to being able to use a cane, et cetera. And now I can walk. I have two beautiful sons. Um, I can lift, you know, so, so like I said, my story is very convoluted in that. I mean, I could go through it piece by piece, but I don't think it re would really serve what we're here for, to be honest. Um, you know, I can definitely go into more of the individual uh, side of it if you want me to. Um, but yeah, so let me know what you, what, what you want to hear, basically. I, I think that people are familiar with these diagnoses, but not, not necessarily how it plays out in your life. So maybe just a few of these symptoms that you were experiencing would be helpful to know just how difficult this was on you. Okay. And a timeline. So where you're at today. Yeah. Your age. Guys, she has two beautiful, healthy sons. And like, that is incredible. The fact that she overcame all of these battles and ultimately was able to give birth twice to two healthy kids. Like that is incredible. That's so cool. So yeah, like none of what you experienced defines you. Like you are just now like a strong, healthy, loving mother, but then there's this whole story behind you. So yeah, just a few of the symptoms, what it was like to be Kathleen 10, 15 years ago. Okay. Yeah. So this happened all around, um, 2014, 2015, era that I went into the hospital in 2015, uh, the beginning of 2015. Um, so to back it all, all the way back then, um, and I, I just want to say too, before I begin going through health challenges is difficult. I'm, I'm not going to say it's not, you know, even go putting myself back there, it can be really difficult. And I still have some hard you know, I'm still working through some of the more emotional side of that. And even when I talk to doctors and work with doctors nowadays and stuff, um, you know, for my sons, et cetera, it's, it's still hard, you know, because of everything that I went through. So I, I very much understand where so many people come from, where it, it is very difficult to deal with these things. So, you know, I think give yourself some grace is what I'm saying. Um, so I, like I said, leading up to about 2015, I started to experience more and more symptoms. Um, it, again, it's kind of hard to say like what was causing what, but I started to have uh, reactions to food. So at one time I got down to, I was only eating three foods, three different kinds of food a day. Um, so that's where the MCAS comes in. I would get burning lips. I would get a rat. What were the three foods? Yes. Oh, oh sorry. What were the? Uh, beef. Um, rice and this very specific kind of tomato sauce. If I couldn't get that tomato sauce, that was it. Yeah. It, it's really weird, right? It, it's weird how you start to respond to food and everyone's viewpoint is, well, let me just remove more and more and more. And then people always ask me, well, how did, like, I can pretty much eat whatever I want to nowadays. You know, of course I'm very, uh, I try to be as selective as possible with, you know, the, the quality, et cetera. But, you know, I don't have an issue if we go out with friends and I, you know, eat restaurant food, et cetera. Um, and so people ask me, like, how did you get there? And this kind of goes to what we'll discuss about the Minnesota starvation experiment. But the best thing I can recommend is whatever those foods you can currently tolerate are, slowly start eating more of them. So really focus on getting your total nutrition, your total calories, et cetera, up. And we're talking very slow. Some people need to increase only 10 calories a week. Um, some people can go 25, 50, you know, and, I, and when you're increasing, so this is kind of reversing, right? Um, 
going slower, in my view, is better to to an extent. I mean, it, there's a lot of nuance here, right? And we'll get into that with the with the uh, starvation experiment. Um, but I think it is important to go slow because you don't want to put on a ton of fat mass in the process. Um, because, and as we'll see with the starvation experiment, lean mass is way um, slower to come back on. And many times you overswing with the fat mass and this weight cycling is, is a huge problem. Um, so, so yes, so that would be my big recommendation is if there are foods that you currently tolerate, slowly start eating more of them. When you get to a point where you're starting to feel a little bit better, then add you know, the next food that you're interested in, that you feel called to, that you fear. I think intuition is so important. So if there's another food that you're like, you know what, that sounds really good. I feel like my body, my brain, soul, whatever is telling me to try it. Have like a quarter of a teaspoon. Like we're talking a very small amount. <laughs> Don't go in and have like any, the entire loaf of sourdough bread or, you know, whatever it is, right? Um, but have a very small amount. Make sure you chew it really well, et cetera. Um, and, and then see how you do, you know, get get in touch with your body. I, I understand, you know, we've talked about this before, but a lot of people, um, they use a lot of these things to to kind of dissociate from their body because they don't like what their body, what their mind, et cetera, is telling them. And so we we put things in our lives to kind of not feel them. Um, so really, it can be a little bit scary when you add something new in. And that's why I'm saying add the slightest amount, because if you have a negative reaction, it's going to be through you quickly and you'll be moving on and there's you know no harm done, et cetera. Um, so yeah, so <laughs> that's the MCAS side. Um, pots, <laughs> um, so with pots, whenever I would go from like sitting down like I am now to or even laying down to standing you know, pretty quickly, I would start to gray out. Um, I did have a couple syncopes, not specifically due to POTS, though. Um, and a lot of people deal with POTS. My blood pressure was always very low. Um, it was always like, you know, the upper 90s systolic, which a lot of people deal with nowadays. A lot of people also have, you know, higher blood pressure. But um, it seems like people that kind of fit more of my um, type, I would say, my symptom type, kind of have more the low blood pressure side of things. Um, Let's see. Next thing, I had a lot of edema. I had tons and tons of weight swings. I cannot tell you, uh, and we will also talk about this at length with the Minnesota Starvation Experiment because they talk about edema or water content of the body at length. And I think it's something that a lot of people are not aware of, and they need to be uh, they they need to be aware of it. But um, my weight would swing all over the place, and I just want to say, a lot of people are like, I "I'm gaining fat so quickly," and it's like you cannot gain three pounds overnight. Like it just, it doesn't happen. Like, so if you get on the scale in the morning and your, your weight is like three pounds up, that that's water. That's for sure water. Um, so, you know, don't, I think the most important thing is really don't catastrophize and don't ruminate. When you find something that seems to be progressing your health forward, even if it's just slowly, that's what we're looking for is slow. I, and I understand that people are like, I need to get there now. I really, I understand it. I, I mean, I understand. Um, but the slower you can go, the more stable you will be. And I find that, um, in the long run, the better off you are. So, um, so yeah, so don't, you know, don't catastrophize, don't ruminate when you find that those handful of things that seem to be helping you just keep putting one foot in front of the other and eventually you will come out on the other side. Um, so yeah, so the, the pots, um, my shoulder, I mean, you, I mean, you've probably seen dislocated shoulders. <laughs> like I would dislocate. I would, I learned how to put it back in. Um, the, the last time I really badly dislocated it, I had been awake on the ship that I was serving aboard for 36 hours because we kept experiencing, um, well, basically my ship was home port shifting from San Diego, California to Sasebo, Japan. And we were doing a bunch of, um, checks and evaluations and workups basically is what they call it to get ready to home port shift. And so I've been up for 36 hours because we kept failing over the electrical plant. Um, and I was the electro, the electro electrical officer on board. Um, and so, you know, I was on board a very new class of ship and, uh, at the time an LPD, it's still pretty new though, an LPD. And it's, um, it's considered more of a smart ship. So there's fewer people on board and then they replace the people with systems. Well, the problem with the systems is that they gave one contract to one company, another contract to another company, and then they didn't communicate. So then when this failed, 
this then failed. It, it, like, it was just a mess. Um, so I was finally going back to finally go to sleep. And they they failed over the ship-wide area network, kind of like the internet of the ship. And I heard the uh, automatic bus transfers because we had a, a port bus, a, a left side of the ship bus um, electrical grid, basically, and a starboard, a, a right side of the ship electrical grid. And it started both one side started to fail. The automatic bus transfer sent it, sent the electrical grid to the other side. It failed and then it sent it back. And so basically all you hear is like click, 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 like going through the ship as the ABTs are trying to send the electrical current like back and forth, basically, um, or the electrical draw back and forth. And I was like, I know I'm going to get a call from engineering control. I literally get a call from engineering control. They're like, Electro, we need you back down in, in, in control. And as I'm coming back down, the ship literally just swayed like it's normal sway. And I pushed up against the ladder well, and my, sh my shoulders popped because that, you know, our bodies break. And I don't want to say break. They, if we do not listen, like my body gave me so many signals beforehand that I needed to stop. But I, I overrode those signals because I didn't have, you know, the courage, whatever it was to go to the chief engineer and be like, I need to go to sleep. Like, I need to take care of myself right now. I understand things are like, not great, but I need to take care of myself. Um, take that for what it is. I, I understand, you know, with children, you can't go to your child and be like, mom needs to sleep, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> so wait, wait, and when the ship is like dead in the water and you're just like drifting, you have, you know, no fuel pumps, the engines aren't working and stuff because the electrical grid is down. Like, you really can't tell the captain, the chief engineer, et cetera, that like, I need to sleep. But like, at a point, some, somehow you need to ask for help is what I'm saying, like from anyone. If you're, if you're getting these signals and your body, your mind is telling you like something is not right and you need to take care of yourself, do it because it will get louder and louder and louder. So my, I dislocated my shoulder and went down, took care of whatever we needed to do. We basically had to like physically bar over um, the electrical plants, which if you're an electrician, you'll understand what I'm saying. I, I won't get into the specifics. Um, but then I went down to medical and thankfully we were a big enough ship that we had like x-ray on board and an actual doctor on board and stuff. And I had her help me put my shoulder back in. And then we took an x-ray across to see the space difference, even with my shoulder back in. And it was, it was like hanging on like the gap in here. It was just like nothing. So that kind of like that with the flu vaccine, with the stress, like I said, of being um, going back and forth with the ship, trying to get it ready to go to Sasebo, Japan, mixed with the fact that I was unhappy with my body image. And so I kept like trying every, you know, I, I've tried all the things as I imagine everyone else has. I've tried carnivore, could not do it because I have a fatty acid oxidation issue. And so I cannot, uh, I need carbohydrates basically, or I, that's why I have ketotic hypoglycemia and recurrent rhabdo. Um, I've tried, you know, fasting. <laughs> I tried the snake diet fasting. Um, I tried vegan, like I tried juice fasting. I mean, all, all, all this stuff. Right. Um, so yeah, so all these things together, like I said, you know, it's not just one thing, um, eventually led to me when I, I had gone to see at my at the time my boyfriend who is now my husband and when I um was flying back from seeing him I had landed from I took off from San Antonio, Texas, had landed in Arizona because I was going back to San Diego and when I was going to get on the plane in Arizona to fly back to San Diego, I passed out for the first time. I had a syncope. Um at the time my shoulder was already in a you know, in a, um, immobilizer in a sling. And so they like, no one knew what was going on, but I literally just like, as I were going down the jetway, I passed out, hit the ground. But right when I hit the ground, I like came right back too. And if, if you've ever had a syncope in your life, your life, you know what it's like, but it's literally like, you just hit the ground and then you come right back. Um, and I was like, oh, that was really weird, but I need to get back to San Diego because <laughs> I'm in the military. <laughs> and, <laughs> And so then I get onto the plane and I, and it happens again, like right when I get on the plane and, you know, very scary because I had no clue what was going on. Right. But I managed to, to convince the paramedics that my blood sugar was just low and I just needed to get some orange juice basically. And then they let me on the flight and we went to San Diego and, um, basically for the next, you know, weeks, um, I had a very hard time of feeling like I was going to have another syncope. My muscles hurt so badly. Like I cannot even begin to tell you the excruciating amount of pain I had from them. Um, I started having tremors. Uh, 
muscle twitches, eye twitches. And I tried all the things, right? I tried calcium, I tried magnesium, I tried potassium, I tried, you know, increasing iron, like, you know, all the things, right? Um, none of it helped. And so, you know, things were kind of ugh, for the next couple of months or so. And then um, it, as I was going to go back to see my now husband, um, I was in the San Diego airport again. So to talk about like a, a uh, fear or like a um, tying to flying. And it did take me a while, quite a while to like be okay with going through airports and like being on the plane again and stuff. So again, I understand the emotional, psychological Im impact of a lot of these things. But, um, you know, I felt like when I was at the airport, it was going to happen again. And, and with this too, I always felt like I was going to lose my bowels, like all this stuff. It's a very common with like a serotonin syndrome state, which you know, people hear serotonin syndrome, but I wasn't taking, um, at the time, any SSRIs or anything like that. Um, I'd been getting shots of Toradol, which was for pain for my shoulder because of how badly it hurt and stuff. And the Toradol was the thing that caused it initially. Um, but now I'm very sensitive to anything that either increases the production of serotonin or delays its breakdown um, because of this. But so I was in the airport, feeling like I was going to pass out again, uh, feeling like I was going to lose my bowels. So I went to the bathroom and when I came out, I passed out, hit my head and I was like, okay, I, I got to go to the hospital. And so that's when I went to um, the Naval Hospital in San Diego. Um, it's one of the country's largest military hospitals. And like I said, they really had no clue what to do. The, the initial labs that came back that were very abnormal was just my creatine kinase and then urine myoglobin. So um, creatine kinase is obviously the main enzyme for um, using creatine in the muscle. And so what was happening is I was going to my muscle and rapidly breaking down. And it was the highest CK that they'd ever seen in their, their entire time working there. Um, so that was the first time I had rhabdo. But they had no clue what was causing it. And, you know, um, I also had symptoms where everything was shaking, like they would do the neurological test and, you know, you, you, the, the neurologist will like resist your hand. And it, it, like, I could not, it was shaking. My same thing with my foot was shaking. Um, yeah, all of this stuff, but to this day, they still don't, I mean, I still don't really have an official diagnosis of like what happens then. I just have a bunch of like, you know, cause with every diagnosis, it's, it's like you fit all of these symptoms for me to then say this, you know, you have this, but, um, there's still to this day, no one really knows exactly what, what, what was going on because, and everything happened together. So like I had serotonin syndrome, I lost the ability to walk. I uh, had rhabdo. Um, I had MCAS issues. I was having POTS issues, like, you know, all of these things. So, um, that's why. I, you know, I think it's important. I, we discuss this, but it's important to look at the body as a system. I, I very much am um, influenced by Dr. Gilbert Ling and Dr. Ray Pete, and I do think that you know the the field effect, looking at things together, not isolated, is very important. Because in my case, like I literally was just failing all over the place, <laughs> like as I imagine a lot of you all are doing. Like your your body is just failing all over, and so there's not much that they can do. Every with. single warning sign yes. was going off. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Um. So eventually my, my mom, who's a nurse, she drove down from Northern California where my parents live. And, um, she, she told the Navy doctors, she's like, you guys are literally doing nothing for her here. Like just release her to, to me. And so she drove me back home and I, I slept for over a month. I just, um, I slept for 23 hours a day, but it wasn't like, um, it wasn't very, refreshing sleep, if that makes sense. Um, I would wake up to have smoothies because that was the only thing that I could handle for some weird reason. Reason It was the only thing that was helping was fruit smoothies, which, you know, if you know about like viral entry into cells and stuff, like most viruses, except for quote COVID uses the glucose transporters. So it kind of makes sense in a, a little bit why I wanted fruit smoothies. Um, and I also would put like maple syrup in there too. So there's like the glucose component of it. Um, but then I would just sleep and, um, I was in a wheelchair, you know, slowly, very slowly over time, I started to build back my strength, my ability to be awake for longer periods of time. Eventually I progressed to using a cane, but the, the way I can describe it is it was very hard for me to think about walking. Like I had to, all of my attention was on put my next leg forward, put my next leg forward. And I knew, you know, this kind of started this like long rabbit hole then of 
basically healing myself because like I said, you know, all the specialists in the world had like no clue what was going on or like how to help or anything. Um, (laughs) And so I knew that I was on a good path when I could very slowly walk across the Golden Gate Bridge again, because that was something that I I love to do. And um, the moment I could do that, that was like, okay, I I know we're, we're heading in the right direction. It took way longer than it should have to walk across the bridge, but I made it across and I was like, okay, you know, I can do this. Um, So, you know, with that, like maybe walking across the Golden Gate is like too much for someone right now, but look for those little things in your life that kind of show you like you're on a good path. And, you know, with the people I work with, something I really like to, to ask them to do is, you know, really define explicitly for yourself what it looks like for you to have what you consider to be good health and wellness you know, ask yourself, like, what does it look like for me to, to be healthy um, and to feel well, et cetera, and really explicitly list those things. And then use that as a marker of, are you on the right path? And, and it's very important too to be, um, you know, reasonable, right? Because when you're, there's different phases of life, just like there's different seasons, right? And so, you know, when you're a mom, some of what you expect of yourself is going to have to be pulled back a little bit, you know, um, when your children get older that can kind of progress again. Like, you know, I, my, my one son, he was five and then I had another son. So like, as he was getting closer to five, like he has become more and more um, able to do things by himself, all that stuff. And so I was starting to get more time and now having a five month old again, like, you know, I have less time to do some stuff and, you know, so you just like rearrange things. Um, And I don't, I don't want it to sound like I'm saying, let your health slack, but you need to you know, be a little bit more reasonable with your expectations of yourself. Like, you know, hey, maybe you're not going to look like this or hey, um, maybe you're not going to get that eight hours of sleep a night or whatever, literally whatever it is. Um, And then once you've kind of defined these things, I I think it's, uh, I think expecting yourself to be, to hit them every single day is over the top. I I don't think that works. I think shooting for something like 80% of every, of the days of your month so like 80% of your month kind of is hitting most of these things. I think that's what we should be aiming for because we're all going to get sick. We're all going to have a, you know, a hard time. We're all going to lose a parent or, like you know, birth a child, like, you know, literally whatever it is. So um, I think really setting those expectations is really important because something that I find is that people get to a point where most of their health and wellness issues, they've cleared up a lot. Um, but it's almost like they feel like they have to keep looking for the next thing that is like causing them problems. And it's like, no, I mean, like things for the most part are pretty good. And now it's time for you to like go out, live your life, like be with other people, you know, stop being so internal. And at the beginning, yes, we have to be incredibly internal and and sometimes selfish and stuff. And that's okay. But eventually we want to kind of progress past that and kind of move more to the external, move more with relationships, being with people, helping people, you know, all that stuff. So, um, but yeah, I mean, (laughs) I could go on and on about more of the symptoms if you want me to, or. So it's very evident, Kathleen, that you were at ground zero, like literally ground zero. It sounds like you almost could have withered away and passed away. Right. And so the, the first time I had rhabdo, I lost 15 pounds of muscle. So. Oh no. Yeah. So, so did you weigh like 85 pounds? Well, so, like- so prior to going into the hospital, I'd had a lot of issues with edema. I was like, um, okay. at, uh, at the very high end of my weight range because I doing this, like, again, we'll discuss this with the Minnesota starvation experiment, but like doing this, like cyclical, like kind of, yep. you know, trying to go on a diet being like, I can't do this. <laughs> like, yeah. So I was very puffy like, all over the place. Um, and so I, I went from like 100 and I don't know, 32 or something like that down to like 117, like overnight, oh, wow. basically. Wow. Um, yeah. So, you know, if there's one thing that I could really recommend is muscle is one of the most important things. Like, I, I know everyone talks about it, but it literally saved my life, my muscle. So, um, and it's hard to get back. But the good thing is, is that once you have the muscle, it's way easier for you to get it back. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, but basically what they surmise and kind of what I surmise too is because I have this like issue um, with fatty acid oxidation when I have gone through my glucose, my glycogen, et cetera, um, my body. And, and again, everything's a, a relative amount, right? Like when I say go through my glucose and glycogen, I'm still doing some relative amounts of fatty acid oxidation, amino acid oxidation, et cetera, right? Um, 
But when I've predominantly gone through all of those sources, then I go to predominantly fatty acids and my body's like, I cannot supply you with enough ATP from fatty acids. So we need to go to amino acids, which is when you go to the muscle tissue, right? And you see this with the Minnesota starvation experiment, the Carnegie star- starvation experiment, et cetera. Um, you go to the muscle until there's basically nothing left. And um, yeah, that's, that's basically what happened to me. So. Oh, wow. So anything you can do to build muscle, to keep your muscle, especially as you get older. And, you know, I just want to say about the old population, really, if you look at a lot of older people, it is the fact that they fall or something, and then they have to go through a major surgery. And that's kind of what eventually leads to their inevitable decline. So yeah. I really want you to focus on prioritizing as much muscle as possible. And like, look at me, like I prioritize lifting and I'm not huge. You know what I'm saying? Like you're never going to, to get like jacked, jacked unless you, you know, are on anabolics or whatever. <laughs> Sarah, I'm sorry. Clearly I'm no, huge. That's okay. Ugh. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I just wanted to relate to what you were saying about the continuously nitpicking your health at a certain point where like maybe you went through something in the past um, and then you started your health journey and then all of a sudden that takes over your whole entire life and you're never off that health journey and you actually don't continue to live like you almost killed the person you were before right. this journey and you no longer have those creative outlets or those relationships or anything and you're solely focusing on like what's the next thing i need to do in order to get rid of this symptom and some of the things you're probably just over fixating on and creating for yourself and so i definitely relate to that i know i've talked to you about this before but um it the exercise that you mentioned of clearly writing out what it looks like for you to be healthy i think is really important because just for my own example, when I was writing out that list, I realized that, you know, I actually have accomplished so many of those things, whereas I still see myself as somebody who's not fully healthy or still broken in many ways, which is just really kind of a mental block yeah. to actually being healthy and living your life. So, and I, and I think it's important to like, it's okay to be at a state where you're still working on things like that's okay. Yeah, right. And it there, none of us are saying that that's unjustified or there isn't a time and place for that. Right. Um, yeah. And so I don't, me hearing Kathleen's story is like, right. Anyone can heal. Yeah. And also the, the, the idea that not every day is going to be perfect and like it's an 80% thing. And if 80% of your days are better then you're already ahead and you're winning. So it's important to keep that in mind because I feel like a lot of our audience and I've, I was this too, are perfectionists. And if every day is not perfect, something's wrong with them. And that's just not realistic in life. I, I, I feel like that's not actually the definition of health. Yeah, I find that people, like I said, they, and, and I understand because there's a lot of anxiety that comes up with all of these things and something else that we'll talk about with the Minnesota starvation experiment. Um, but we get to a point where we start to ruminate and catastrophize a lot of these things. And then what, what do we do? We're like, I need to fix this right now because I cannot take a step back. Like there's no way I can go back. And so we throw everything at it, right? We throw the supplements, we throw the gadgets, like we're like everything at it. (laughs) Instead of just being like, I think it's more important to be curious and to be like, okay, you know, was there maybe something that I did yesterday or the day before today or whatever that may have gotten me to this point? And, and maybe that thing was okay because maybe it brought you a lot of value. Like maybe it was going hiking with a friend and it just happened to be a little bit too much and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, so not putting a judgment on it, just being like, okay, this happened. This was the effect. This, you know, very, very scientific, right? Like <laughs> cause and effect <laughs> experiments. Um, and, you know, maybe next time if I do that, you know, we don't go as long when we go hiking or, you know, literally whatever it is. Um, but not, to, so to be more curious versus to be like, there's something wrong. It, it's like, you know, kind, kind of talking about like um, dissociation or desensitization and stuff. A lot of people, they're so used to not getting blood flow and stuff to their hands, kind of like a mild cyanosis type thing going on. And then all of a sudden, 
like they start working on things, things start to dilate a little bit more um, to their normal amount, right? Like we're not talking about over dilation. And all of a sudden they're getting more warmth and more blood flow to their hands and stuff. And they're like, oh my goodness, I'm having a bad reaction. And, and I'm, I don't mean to like make light of that because it is very traumatizing when it happens. It's like, what's going on? You know, like, w- why are my hands turning red or like all that stuff? Um, But a lot of it is because like, you'd gotten so used to your current normal that now you're starting to experience a new normal. And it, it's like, you know, maybe it's not a bad thing. Like maybe just be a little bit more curious about like, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's meaning some of these things are starting to, to come online again and stuff. Um, because, you know, I very much as a physicist look at things in terms of equilibrium. And this is why I'm a much more staunch proponent of going very slow, especially when it comes to supplements, especially when it comes, like I said, to food, et cetera. Um, you know, introduce things very slowly and really pay attention to how you respond to it. Because I guarantee you, there's a lot of people out there right now that a lot of your negative symptoms, like he seem to be getting worse and worse and worse, have to do with your taking way too many supplements or the way wrong amount of dose or frequency, you know, all, whatever it is. Um, so yeah. From an outsider's perspective, it kind of seems like there was just an influx of things that went wrong right at the same time. Right. And that was like a huge stress burden on your body that you potentially weren't fueling yourself enough to handle. Right. So too much stress, too many events, you know, maybe the flu vaccine, this, this collection of events in an underfueled body with maybe some metabolic problems just led to some collection and recipe for disaster. Like that was, you dealt with a disaster yeah. in your body. Yeah. Um, what would you think is what helped you get out? Like it, I understand the most important thing that helped you get out, whether that was, like you said, the emotional side of things, but also maybe fueling yourself and how would you define your path out of, of that state? Yeah. And and so really fast, just to like qualify the metabolic stuff. So as long as I'm getting enough, um, you know, carnitine slash supporting carnitine synthesis, um, as long as I'm getting enough B2, B5, et cetera, I don't really necessarily have issues with fatty acid oxidation. So this kind of goes back to um, eating enough food. The more food you eat, the more micronutrients you get, right? Um, and we've talked about this before. There's there's such a huge push for more and more and more protein. And I think the reason for that is because per calorie, the amount of micronutrients and protein tends to be more, you know, obviously folates is different and stuff, but on average, that seems to be a thing. So people will focus on protein to make sure they're getting enough micros in because they're like, well, I can only eat 1800 calories a day or, you know, whatever it is. Um, where if you eat more, you're naturally hitting those RDAs. Like it's like no problem, you know, like hitting the potassium RDA, you don't have to take any type of supplemental potassium. Like it's no problem. Um, so, so kind of going forward, so like, it, I, I kind of look at health as like, there's multiple pieces of a pie, right? And, and I, I don't want to overwhelm someone because I think at the beginning, you know, this is something that I very much um, respect Dr. Ray Pete for is because he would come back with very simple kind of more biochem side of things. Like, did you check pulse and temperature? Did you, are you getting enough calcium? Like, you know, kind of more of these basic things, which I know a lot of people were like, I just sent you this long email and this is all you sent me back. And they're like, what, you know, what the heck? Um, but I do think at the beginning, you know, kind of focusing a little bit more on the biochem biophysics side of things can be really helpful because that then will then give you kind of more the energy to start to approach it, approach the, um, the, the structural side, which I think is very important, you know, movement, uh, like I, I have a lot of ish structural issues because I spent cumulative years in slings and stuff like that, right? I could not use my left arm. Um, so, you know, that is a, a piece of it. Um, obviously, the structure issues of having HEDS and, um, uh, you know, losing muscle so rapidly and then putting it back on and stuff. Um, so I think structure is important. I think the psycho-emotional is very important, but it can be very, very difficult to um, get there. Um, for the psycho-emotional, when one is ready, I really, really like Journal Speak and the Curable app. Both of them are marketed more for chronic pain, but I find that they help with so many things, not just chronic pain. Um, but, you know, I think you kind of need to get there. So again, kind of back to this biochem piece. So when I talk about biochem, I'm mostly talking about food and supplementation. Biophysics, I'm more talking about like sunlight, grounding, um, if people use like infrared panels, stuff like that. Um, So with, for me, 
for sure, a very long, but slow reverse diet was something that helped me immensely. And, you know, I'm five feet tall, normal, about 113, 115 pounds, and I'm eating, you know, um, 2,800 to 3,000 plus calories a day and not gaining weight. If anything, you know, while breastfeeding, I was losing weight to get back to my pre-pregnancy um, weight. So, but again, very, very slowly. And again, if you cannot tolerate multiple foods right now, do what you can, eat what you can very slowly increase. And I also find too that there's a threshold effect for many people. So like someone might say, oh, I can't eat that because, um, you know, I get whatever symptom from it. And it's like, okay, maybe you can't handle a cup of this at a meal or a slice of this at a meal or whatever, but maybe you can handle like a fourth of a cup and then you can just increase the frequency that you eat that. Um, so I find that to be very helpful. Um, so yes, yeah, so on the biochem side, I would say food for sure. Number one thing, very slow reverse. For me, when I say that pantothine, so not pantothenic, um, but pantothine saved my life. Like I literally, I, I mean it. Like there, there can be supplements for some people that can literally pull you out of a very, very dark place. And that's kind of how I look at supplementation is that they can pull you out of a very, uh, like I said, dark negative place to get you kind of start to function a little bit better or on the other extreme they can be used for very specific goals like um you know if you're trying to build a little bit more muscle or you know cognitive goals etc um but i think the problem is is that people are not eating enough and so they're trying to out supplement their diet because of the fact they're not eating enough where it's like if we can just eat enough then you don't necessarily have to focus on these things um like I said, too, I also think people are taking way too high of a dose of something. And so what happens? Well, first of all, there's like transporter issues, transporters downregulate, they upregulate all of that stuff. But um, you take something and like you might feel good for a day or two, but now you've like pushed the poked metabolic machinery, whatever you want to call it, like on to the next step. And now you don't have enough for that next step. And then you like feel horrible again. You like fall apart again because you now need to take the next supplement. But yet you keep taking this one because it made you initially feel good. And so you're like, I need to take more and more of it. You know, um, I don't, I don't think that's right. Like, I think once you kind of get the positive from it, you need to, like I said, come back off of it, um, dose and frequency and kind of find that minimum effective dose, minimum effective frequency. Um, so I think supplementation can be great, but it should never replace eating enough for sure. Um, and sometimes people just need different forms. Like I do really well with pantothine. I get nothing from high dose pantothenic acid, but that's because pantothine is closer down the step to making coenzyme A. And for whatever reason, I need a lot of coenzyme A. Um, I, I don't know. Anyways, um, sunlight also very big for me. Uh, heat was something that was incredibly helpful for me. I would, um, you know, sit outside in the like very hot California sun and um, just like, you know, obviously not get sunburned and stuff, but, you know, the heat from the sun and then uh, really warm, like literally to like hot tolerance baths to keep me warm. And, you know, kind of like the more biophysics side of that is uh, Dr. Daryl Pollock kind of um, has taken some of Dr. Gilbert Ling's work and shown that when you add infrared light, um, it causes the water in the cells to structure more. And then if you add UV light, that, that gives them more energy. And so I basically use the heat to help me structure my cells when I cannot structure my cells metabolically. Um, so I think sunlight is very important. Again, within reason, I don't want people getting sunburned, but, you know, and, and I also think people need to kind of reframe their idea of time, especially as parents or especially as like very busy people. Um, one minute is a long time. Five minutes is a super long time. So if you can get outside for one minute or even like even if one minute is too long, if you can literally walk out your door, look in the direction of the sun, not at the sun, but in the direction of the sun and literally just walk, walk right back in your door and you can do that before the UV rise in the morning, which is about 9 a.m. But you look it up like D-Minder can be great for that um, around solar noon. And then as UV falls off in the evening as the sun is setting, that can be incredibly helpful. Um, from the biophysics side of things. And then um, I already talked about the psycho-emotional side. Like I said, general speak, curable app has been immensely helpful, not only for myself, but for the people I work with. Um, and then the structure side, I'm constantly working on the structure side. <laughs> my, my outward physical body is still, um, you know, still still a work in progress, I would say. But um, I, I think a lot of people do way too high volume. Um, I think, you know, a really a focus on hypertrophy can be really important until you get to the point where you have a solid amount of muscle and then adding kind of some more um, 
you know, other things like plyometrics and other, other things can be really helpful. Um, but I, you know, I think a lot of people see a lot of these accounts on Instagram and they're doing a lot of like concurrent training and stuff and, and they're like jacked. And so people are like, oh, I can like build a lot of muscle doing this. But I think a lot of people miss the idea that they probably built a lot of that muscle before they started doing their other training. So while it looks a lot of fun and stuff, it's like, you know, let's just spend a solid like five years or something getting on some, you know, solid amount of muscle. And then from there, it's like, okay, yeah, you want to go, you know, do some five Ks, you want to do some plyometrics, like literally whatever it is, like go for it. But until then, like, you know, let's really take some time to really focus on, on hypertrophy. Um, so hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so many different things to dive into. You literally just, that was, this is a one. <laughs> <laughs> that was crazy. Kathleen will be a repeat guest as long as she will let us yeah. take her time. But I think the, one of the most refreshing things is just your realistic timeline of healing and what it takes. Like you literally just mentioned, let's take five years to build this muscle. Right. Most people are thinking in terms of like, Oh, a month, 60 days, 30 one days. Workout. Right. It's because like what we've become accustomed to are these quick fixes and and that really just isn't realistic. So I, we know you need to head off to leave your mom, but, um, just one more thing really fast. Yeah, yeah. go for it. <laughs> uh, like I said, I think equilibrium states are very important. And so as a physicist, we talk about like stable equilibrium, unstable equilibrium, all that. And, you know, someone might be in a stable equilibrium well down here and it's like very low energy state. And we like want to get you up here, like right as high as possible. But the problem is, is that like, if you, take a bunch of things, do a bunch of things, and you shoot yourself up there, like your body, your mind, everything is not used to that. You're fundamentally changing every part of your life very quickly. And it just never goes well. Or say you're in an unstable equilibrium. So you're like on a hill, you're like a ball on the hill. And I just nudge you this way, you come crashing down the hill, right? Uh, or, or this way too. Um, you don't want to do that. You want to, you know, very slowly uh, work on things. And, and my view is that like, if you need to go faster, if you are in such an acute situation that you need to go faster, I think you need to be monitored by a, a health professional. They need to be tracking your labs. They need to be tracking your electrolytes, like all of that stuff. Um, maybe inpatient if possible, because, because of all these things we've just been discussing. So um, I think you know, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And, you know, back to this, the starting off with like biochem and biophysics, I think the idea that the rising tide lifts all boats is very important. So if you can get these two things kind of under control, or at least the 80% under control, then that will give you the ability to address some of these other things. Um, so, you know, a lot of people think there's, it can't be that simple. It's no way that more food is going to, to solve me. I, I have all these complex diagnoses, like it, there's no way. And while it may not be the only thing, I promise you, if you do not get the more foundational things right, then like, how do you know what's left basically? You know, um, so a good like eventual goal calorie wise, I like to see people get to at least 45 calories times your kilogram of body weight. Um, I think that's like a good initial like goal for calories. Um, obviously, if you can go higher and you're still in maintenance and stuff, I say go for it. You know, see, see as high as you can go. Um, some people, you know, eventually like me, I'm just like, I'm like, I don't want to eat anymore. Or I don't have the time of the day to eat anymore. How many more <laughs> potatoes can I fit into this meal? <laughs> exactly. So like when I hit 3000 calories, I'm like, okay, I need to, you know, this, this, this is a tour for now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I need to add more protein to kind of stunt that. But so yeah, I'll leave that. I'll leave it there. I just want to, so for somebody who doesn't have a calculator, just to put that into perspective, 45 times, let's say you weighed 160 pounds. That would have been um, so, so 160 pounds divided by 2.2 to get your kilograms. Yeah, that's around 3,200 to 3,300 calories. Yes. So that's significantly different than we're talking the standard 2,000, 2,200 calorie recommendations we see on a lot of social media accounts. So and this is going to be really the the foundation of our future conversations with Kathleen. And I think that this first episode was like an, a vital primer of one of the things that helped Kathleen heal right. was yeah. to eat more. Well, we haven't even talked about that yet. I feel like we need to end this almost so people can like kind of digest what you just said, <laughs> because it was a lot of important things. But essentially, <laughs> Kathleen provided such, you simplified healing into small digestible steps. Yes. You're never going to go fast. But at the end of the day, no one is going to heal in a low calorie state. Right. And that's really hard for people to hear right. because we're told elsewhere from every other circle on the internet 
I can't wait to get into what you recommend. Like people, when you, okay, so, so far you've been talking about muscle lifting, all these different things. People probably think it's all about the protein. Oh, yeah, no. All these different things. I can't wait. Yeah, okay. I'm to myth bust yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's leave that for next time. Definitely. But yeah. Okay, Kathleen, we appreciate your time. I know you're a busy mom and you've got meals to eat because you got calories to eat. So <laughs> go peel those potatoes, Kathleen. <laughs> I, oatmeal has been my my go to right now. Oh, still, I'm, I'm still a potato. Yeah. I'm still sourdough potato or just my jam. Yeah, I, I keep going back. Like I kind of like um, with my son, like he'll go back and forth between like protein sources and stuff where he's like, I really want cheese and I really want steak and I really want pork chops, you know, whatever it is. Um, I kind of in the same with carbohydrates where I go through like I want all the potatoes and then I want all the sourdough bread and then all the oatmeal and stuff. So, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And you're tuning in and you're listening exactly. to that. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 Just like how your son and. In- intuitively knows to do that yeah Yeah. all right well thank you so much kathleen we look forward to the next episode where we dive into the minnesota starvation experiment to help share with everyone how most people are probably chronically under eating yes yes and i i really fast i understand someone's going to sit there and say but i have all this extra weight or i'm obese you know whatever um and they're they're gonna say this is not me i'm gonna click off of this please just listen. If, if yeah. there's anything I could say, please just listen. I'm not saying that um, it will, the process will look the same for you. And I think that we should maybe do a, a discussion about how it would be slightly different for someone that is in that state. And I would also yeah. say too, that a lot of people think that they are overweight because of fat, but the edema problem is a huge problem. And so just be open to it. Um, you know, I, I think any good scientist is open to having their beliefs completely changed and stuff so i'm also open to things too um but uh yeah please please listen and and definitely give us your feedback and anything that you want to hear so yeah all right thanks kathleen stay tuned for series two where we dive into the starvation experiment and how that applies to so many health problems today